one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. This is Radio Free Mormon on the air, broadcasting behind enemy lines. Tonight's episode, we have some breaking news for you. Today's date is June 11th, 2019, and you will recall that only two days ago, on Sunday, June 9th, 2019, I released a podcast titled, Daniel C. Peterson, The Artful Dodger of Mormon Apologetics. In that podcast, I talked about how one year ago in a Deseret News article, Professor Daniel C. Peterson of Brigham Young University wrote a column regarding the First Vision accounts and overstepped the bounds of propriety by actually telling an untruth, a mendacity, what lesser minds would call a lie, and that he did this when he said, point blank, there has been no suppression of the First Vision accounts. In that episode, I went back and talked about all of the different things that were going on behind the scenes in comments on different blog posts. Some of them comments by Daniel C. Peterson in which he said that he would respond to this allegation, but he wouldn't do it a year ago. Instead, he would do it when he felt like it, when he got around to it, and he would do it in a place and time of his choosing. Well, apparently, my podcast from two days ago was the straw that broke the professor's back. And before the sun went down, last Sunday, June 9th, 2019, the same day that my podcast released, Daniel C. Peterson went to his blog post at Sick at Non in order to respond to this allegation. Now, I do not know what has happened in the past year to suddenly get Dan Peterson off the dime and responding to this issue. But plainly, I've hit a nerve. And not only did Professor Peterson do a blog post on this on Sunday, he did another blog post on the same issue the following day on Monday. Monday, June 10th. So even though for a full year we could not get Professor Peterson to issue a public response to this allegation, suddenly things have changed and we can't get him to shut up about it. I want to go through his two blog post responses because actually, even though he's trying to respond to this allegation, he ends up doing it in a way that just digs himself deeper. And in the course of his two blog posts, he displays, as is his penchant, a number of of Mormon apologetic tactics and strategies and logical fallacies in order to try and see his way clear of the allegation that he lied when he said a year ago there has been no suppression of the First Vision accounts. And I do not want to beat a dead horse here. However, it is essential to understand that in my podcast number 33 from last year, Selling Your Soul for Apologetics, as well as my podcast from June 9th of this year, Daniel C. Peterson, The Artful Dodger of Mormon Apologetics, my focus has been very narrow. It has been specifically on the suppression of the First Vision account by Joseph Fielding Smith during the time period when he was church historian, when he or someone at his direction in the 1930s cut the 1832 account of the first vision out of the letter book in which it was contained, and then Joseph Ealing Smith hid it in his safe for 30 years until news of its existence had leaked to the public, and he was thereby compelled to put it back in the letter book and direct the attention of Paul Chessman to it, who was currently at that time in 1965 doing his master's thesis at BYU. The reason that's important is because Daniel C. Peterson is going to start his first blog from June 9th talking about anything and everything other than that specific allegation. He will work his way around to it. However, it's important for him that he set up a straw man first. Let's go to that article now. The title is, Once More on the First Vision. Now, it's important to see that as of the time I'm recording this, this particular blog post has 187 comments. This is a hugely controversial issue, and there are a number of people holding Dan Peterson's feet to the fire, as well as some of his more strident lackeys defending the honor of Daniel Peterson. It is not my intent to go into the comments of this blog post, but simply to deal with the blog post itself, I do heartily recommend that you go look at his blog post and read the comments for yourselves because they are hugely entertaining, believe me. But the reason I bring up the fact there are 187 comments on this particular blog is to compare it with other blogs he has done recently and show that by comparison, this one is getting a lot of activity. For instance, after he posted this blog, he posted a blog titled Heartland Heartbreak and Unsleeping Malice. That blog has garnered the grand total of four comments. Then we get to his second blog concerning the First Vision, which is titled Returning Yet Again to the 1832 Account of the First Vision. By the way, apparently there's a C missing in that title. It should be A-C-C-O-U-N-T, Account of the First Vision. Instead, he has it spelled A-C-O-U-N-T. 
O-U-N-T. It appears that Professor Peterson may be under some mental duress while posting this second blog. But that blog has 69 comments. Once again, an unusually high number. Then if we get to the blog after that, Joseph Smith, Plural Marriage, Polyandry, DNA, and Josephine Lyon, there's once again only four comments, not a lot of interest there. And then his most recent blog post as of my recording this podcast, Beyond the Heartland, which has garnered all of two comments. So let's click on his blog article once more on the first vision. This again is the blog he posted on June 9th, 2019 in direct response to my podcast that was published that same day early in the morning. Professor Peterson begins this blog post. I just arrived this afternoon from Tel Aviv and Paris. You remember how I said in my last podcast that Professor Peterson has a habit of wanting his readers to know how well-traveled he is? This is a classic example. Once again, I just arrived this afternoon from Tel Aviv and Paris and have frankly spent too much time since then in a state of profound but very pleasant unconsciousness. Apparently that means he was taking a nap. But it seems that I'm under vigorous attack somewhere. (laughs) Okay, wait a second. Somewhere, you know perfectly well where you're under vigorous attack. It's from me, yours truly, at Radio Free Mormon. You're under attack at Radio Free Mormon. But that is the podcast that must not be named. Once again, back to his blog post. But it seems that I'm under vigorous attack somewhere as having lied in the 31st May 2018 Deseret News column that I just now reposted about accounts of Joseph Smith's first vision. Now, I want to give credit here to Professor Peterson for actually reposting his Deseret News column from a year ago, and he reposted it at his blog. So it is on Daniel Peterson's blog for purposes of comparison, and it does appear that he kept the language the same. He did not go back and change the fact that he said there's been no suppression of the First Vision accounts. Believe me, I checked. And it's just possible that Professor Peterson knew I would check, and that's maybe why he didn't change the wording. However, I want to attribute the best motives to him. I'm sure this was done in a sincere effort on his part to be open and transparent. Professor Peterson goes on, In the demonology of certain critics of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, once again, demonology is the study of demons. It includes a list of demons. And what Daniel Peterson here is doing is saying that among certain critics, he is a demon. In the demonology of certain critics of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, especially of a relative handful of embittered apostates who cheer each other on in such things, accusations of dishonesty are commonly the weapon of first resort. Now, I want to respond to this right now because I don't know about other people. Some people do immediately leap to the worst possible motives that a person can have. I try to avoid that. I have not accused Professor Peterson of making a false statement in other areas where it's pretty clear to me that he probably is, but I want to give him the benefit of the doubt wherever I can. It's only in a situation where he flat out says there has been no suppression of first vision accounts, including the 1832 vision account, when manifestly there was suppression of that account, that I am not able to find any charitable interpretation of those facts other than that Professor Peterson is telling something that is not true. In short, that he is lying. Back to the blog. In the demonology of certain critics of the church, accusations of dishonesty are commonly the weapon of first resort. He goes on now. Disagreement with their view of disputed topics must rest ultimately on either ignorance or where a claim of ignorance is implausible on deliberate deception. I suppose that I should be flattered that I typically fall into the latter category. In other words, we're not saying he's ignorant, we're saying he's lying. Well, that certainly seems to be the case with his statement that there was no suppression of the First Vision accounts. Professor Peterson goes on to indicate what it is that prompted this very quick response by him on his blog. The very first email that I received upon landing at the Salt Lake City Airport today announced that my integrity is now in doubt because of my stance on the first vision. Now, Professor Peterson does not tell us who wrote this email to him, but apparently it was a person of such significance to Daniel C. Peterson that he got on the stick and got this entire blog post written and published the same day. Again, he says, the very first email that I received upon landing at the Salt Lake City Airport today announced that my integrity is now in doubt because of my stance on the first vision. And of course, he has to add the next line. He cannot resist playing the victim card, as I pointed out in my last podcast. Here's where he does it 
here. Actually, he's going to do it throughout, but here he does it again. As if, in such circles, I had ever been considered to possess a shred of integrity in the first place. So, once again, this is the example of the ad strominum argument that Professor Peterson has made famous. First off, I have never said or intimated that he does not possess a shred of integrity. I am sure he does have a shred of integrity. I'm sorry. I am sure he does have a shred of integrity and probably even two shreds. But the point is to attribute to me an insult to him that I never made in the first place so he can then play the victim. But Daniel C. Peterson isn't done playing the victim card. No, this was just his opening bid. He goes on in his blog to say, my latest crime against decency, honesty, and truth is my assertion in that year old column for the Deseret News. That was a long, long time ago, see. In that year old column for the Deseret News, that believing Latter day Saint scholars and leaders have known about and have openly spoken and written about the various First Vision accounts for at least 50 years. Well, now, wait a second. That was not at all the assertion that I made on Radio Free Mormon. I did not question for one second his assertion that believing Latter-day Saint scholars and leaders have known about and openly spoken about and written about the various First Vision accounts for at least 50 years. That part is a matter of public record. Although I have to say that's probably more true of Latter-day Saint scholars rather than leaders, I did not question that assertion at all. And so this is now... Daniel C. Peterson putting up a huge straw man. He wants to say that he was accused of dishonesty for this statement that he made when he was not accused of dishonesty for this statement that he made. The accusation of dishonesty comes in when he said there's been no suppression of the First Vision accounts in light of what Joseph Fielding Smith did with the 1832 account in his say for three decades. But it is important to Daniel C. Peterson to put up this straw man argument so he can soundly defeat it before finally getting to the actual issue at hand. So having set up his straw man, he says, however, I stand by that assertion. And here are just four examples of the evidence on which I would rely to defend it. Now here you'll note he cites four different documents from different scholars, none of them leaders, I have to note, parenthetically, but from four different scholars, all of them since 1965, when Paul Chessman was allowed to finally see the 1832 account of the First Vision, which had been freshly liberated from Joseph Fielding Smith's safe in the church historian's office. And that is the first of the four publications to which Professor Peterson cites. Paul R. Chessman, an analysis of the accounts relating Joseph Smith's early visions, master's thesis, Brigham Young University, 1965. Professor Peterson says this thesis contained the first publication of the 1832 account. Well, technically, it actually is not the first publication. It was the first document in which it had been copied and printed. But a master's thesis is not typically published. In other words, it's not made available to the world. It doesn't go through a publication process. It is normally more of an in-house kind of thing. And the reason that's important to point out is because the first people to actually publish the 1832 account was not Paul Chessman or BYU. It was Gerald and Sandra Tanner, who managed to get a copy of Paul Chessman's master's thesis and then copy the 1832 account, which had been transcribed as Appendix D in the master's thesis. And they are the first ones to actually publish the 1832 account. So when Dan Peterson states, this thesis contained the first publication of the 1832 account, that is technically wrong. Just pointing that out for posterity. The second article is James B. Allen, The Significance of Joseph Smith's First Vision in Mormon Thought, published in Dialogue, Volume 1, Number 3, back in 1966. So that's the year after Paul Chessman wrote his master's thesis. The third article is Dean Jesse, The Early Accounts of Joseph Smith's First Vision, published in BYU Studies in spring of 1969. So now that's three years later. Number four is James B. Allen again, but this one, an Improvement Era article, April of 1970, titled Eight Contemporary Accounts of Joseph Smith's First Vision. What do we learn from them? This is the Improvement Era article that Elder Ballard referred to in his face-to-face devotional, with Elder Oaks not too long ago. And the fifth publication is Milton V. Backman Jr., Joseph Smith's First Vision, The First Vision in Its Historical Context, published by Bookcraft, 1971. Now, interestingly, Professor Peterson says there are four examples of the evidence on which he would rely, and then he lists not four, but five examples. Plainly, Professor Peterson rushed this blog to get it up as soon as possible and did not spend a lot of time proofreading it. After having thoroughly decimated this straw man argument, 
Professor Peterson is now to proceed to the actual point that I raised a year ago in episode 33, Selling Your Soul for Apologetics, and which I resurrected two days ago on January 9th, 2019, Daniel C. Peterson, the Artful Dodger of Mormon Apologetics, which is that he did not tell the truth and intentionally did not tell the truth when he said in his Deseret News article from a year ago that there has been no suppression of the first vision accounts. Here is where Daniel C. Peterson finally gets to the point. Quote, I'm also being branded a liar because of my declaration in that 31st May 2018 Deseret News column that there's been no scandal and no suppression of the variant accounts of the first vision. So finally, Professor Peterson actually gets to the issue. What is his defense? Quote, I stand by that statement as well, and particularly when referring to the past 50 years, period, end of quote. Yes, Professor Peterson, a professor at an institution of higher learning, actually wrote that. I stand by that statement as well, the statement that there's been no suppression, and particularly when referring to the past 50 years. This one statement is the money quote of this entire blog. How can you possibly stand by your statement that there has been no suppression and then modify it by saying, and particularly when referring to the past 50 years? You cannot modify an absolute statement and then say that both the absolute statement and the modification of it are correct. This is like Ted Bundy saying, if he were still alive, I never murdered anybody and particularly within the last 30 years. Or this is like Mark Hoffman saying, I never forged any documents particularly in the last 30 years. You can see how ridiculous these kinds of statements are, and yet Professor Peterson has no problem making the same kind of outlandish, self-contradictory statement. I stand by that statement as well, and particularly when referring to the past 50 years. So you see, Professor Peterson actually does know that there was a problem with the 1832 account before 1965. In other words, before the past 50 years. And he knows good and well that what happened with that first vision account more than 50 years ago qualifies as suppression of the document. Daniel Peterson actually goes on to admit this. He states, Is it possible that Elder Joseph Fielding Smith, who headed up the then very small and non-professional office of the church historian and recorder from 1921 to 1970, a position that never in those days entailed the production of academic historiography, sat on one or more unpublished First Vision accounts. Yes, it is. What? He says, yes, it is. And by the way, when you take out all of these apologetic deflections and excuse making in this sentence, he says, is it possible that Elder Joseph Fielding Smith sat on one or more unpublished First Vision accounts? Yes, it is. That's what Daniel Peterson writes. Yes, it is possible that he did that. He says, I've heard some assertions to that effect, but I no longer recall the details, such as they were, and I would need to research a bit to be sure of the facts, if indeed it is possible to be so. So he's super hazy on the facts. He really doesn't know what happened. He's not aware of the details, but he is aware of the details enough to say that, yes, it's possible that Elder Joseph Fielding Smith sat on that's his phrase, sat on, he even puts it in quotes, sat on one or more unpublished First Vision accounts. Professor Peterson then says, since the mid to late 1960s, however, which is to say, just as I said, for the past 50 years, hold it, hold it, Professor Peterson. This is where he does the shell change. This is where he does the old switcheroo. He did not say for the past 50 years in the original article from a year ago in the Deseret News. What he said was, there has been no suppression period. It was an absolute unqualified statement, as I pointed out in my last podcast. But now he's trying to change it around and hope, hope, hope to God that you will not notice. Since the mid to late 1960s, however, he says, which is to say, just as I said, for the past 50 years, there can be no serious, plausible claim that the church has suppressed the non-canonical accounts of the first vision. Well, that's the whole point. I never made the claim that in the past 50 years, the church has suppressed the 1832 account of the first vision. I was pointing out to before the last 50 years, Professor Peterson knows this good and well, and his three-card Monty of a sentence here 
is not going to pass muster. So once again, this sentence, which he uses to show why it is he was not deceiving originally, but which itself contains another deception to sort of mask the original deception, states, Since the mid to late 1960s, however, which is to say, just as I said, for the past 50 years, there can be no serious, plausible claim that the church has suppressed the non-canonical accounts of the first vision. Well, well done, Professor Peterson. With this blog post alone, you have once again well earned your title of the Artful Dodger of Mormon Apologetics. So in this paragraph, Daniel Peterson has admitted that it is possible that Elder Joseph Fielding Smith did sit on one or more unpublished First Vision accounts. Well, that has been the entire issue from the beginning, because prior to the 1960s, the church did suppress the 1832 account of the First Vision, and it was done by an apostle in the church, Joseph Fielding Smith, who was also at the same time the church historian, and he suppressed it by cutting it out of the letter book and hiding it in his safe and not permitting people to even look at it unless they got authorization from somebody above Joseph Fielding Smith. And Joseph Fielding Smith, being an apostle, the people with authority above him to make him do anything was extremely limited. Now Daniel Peterson gets to his final paragraph. The background is important. Really solid academic historical writing in the church can only really be said to have begun to flourish with the rapid expansion of Brigham Young University following World War II. Now you know this is an important point to Professor Peterson because he says really not once but twice in this same sentence. He says really solid academic historical writing in the church can only really be said to have begun to flourish with the rapid expansion of Brigham Young University following World War II and with the founding of BYU Studies in 1959, of the Mormon History Association in 1965, and of Dialogue, a journal of Mormon thought in 1966. Notice how teeming with details and information Daniel Peterson suddenly is when it comes to talking about things that he wants to talk about. In stark contrast to this, when talking about Joseph Fielding Smith's suppression of the 1832 First Vision account, a subject Daniel Peterson decidedly does not want to talk about, all of a sudden his memory gets all hazy and sketchy and he's not sure of the facts at all. Remember that after admitting it's possible that Joseph Fielding Smith sat on the First Vision accounts, his memory starts getting really fuzzy. He says, I've heard some assertions to that effect, but I no longer recall the details such as they were, and I would need to research a bit to be sure of the facts if indeed it is possible to be so. So you can see how hazy Daniel Peterson's memory is on subjects that he wants to be hazy about. But we also have to look at this claim of lack of memory and say, Professor Peterson, if you really don't know the details, which isn't true, if you really don't know the details, I mean, he's the godfather of Mormon apologetics for crying out loud, of course he knows the details. If you really don't know the details, why is it that you're making blanket assertions that there was no suppression in your Deseret News article a year ago, a person, a scholar, a professor at an institution of higher learning for crying out loud should know that you don't go around making blanket assertions unless you are sure of your facts. But here he's claiming not to really be sure of the facts. He would need to do some more research to be sure. Apparently he's too busy to do that. But now in the next paragraph, all of a sudden, he knows the entire history with dates of the founding of multiple scholarly Mormon-related publications. As he says, with the founding of BYU Studies in 1959, of the Mormon History Association in 1965, and of Dialogue, a Journal of Mormon Thought in 1966. He concludes, younger people today probably don't realize how sparse the venues were and how rare the relevant scholars were in the much smaller and more rural and poorer church of the 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s, i.e. during those decades that Joseph Fielding Smith was suppressing the 1832 First Vision account. The final sentence, once trained scholars were available and outlets existed for sharing their research, things began to take off. Well, the problem is that trained scholars being available and outlets existing have nothing to do with whether Joseph Fielding Smith suppressed the 1832 account of the first vision. This is a classic non sequitur. The conclusion does not follow from the premise. And all the trained scholars in the world, Professor Peterson, and all the available publication outlets in the world cannot help if the 1832 account of the first vision is hidden away and suppressed in a safe and unavailable for scholars to look at. Daniel Peterson appears to want to give the impression that during this time period of the 30s, 40s, and 50s, the church had no publication outlets, no venues, no scholarship, no history written, when that is completely different from the actual historical 
reality. The reality is that Joseph Ely Smith, in his capacity as church historian, was busy writing and publishing a number of books, not only on doctrine, which he was famous for, but also on history, which he is less famous for. It was Joseph Ely Smith who, after combing the records and the sermons and statements of Joseph Smith, edited and published the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith in 1938. Yes, most of us are familiar with that book, Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith. Fewer of us are aware that it was edited by Joseph Fielding Smith when he was the church historian. But that's not all. There is also a very thick one-volume history book of the LDS Church. It's titled Essentials in Church History. And that also was written by Joseph Fielding Smith when he was the church historian. There were many venues for publication of church history during Joseph Fielding Smith's lengthy tenure as church historian. So that is the end of Daniel Peterson's June 9th blog post. But he wasn't done. He went on to write another blog post the following day on Monday, June 10th, 2019, once again in response to my podcast from the morning of Sunday, June 9th, criticizing him for his deception in saying that there had been no suppression. So in his first blog post, he admits the possibility now that Joseph Fielding Smith did sit on the First Vision account. In his second blog post, titled Returning Yet Again to the 1832 Account of the First Vision, Daniel Peterson goes on with this theme, quote, I've seen a number of comments in two or three places and have received several emails pronouncing me a liar a shameless and deliberate deceiver. You see, once again, there's the ad strominum. A shameless and deliberate deceiver. Because of my position regarding Joseph Smith's 1832 account of the first vision, such accusations may or may not speak eloquently about those leveling them. They say nothing whatever about me. I believe exactly what I've said about this subject. Well, now here's the problem, Professor Peterson. You say you believe exactly what you've said about the subject, but the problem is, is that you've said two different things about the subject, and both of them contradict each other. In the first place, you said there has been no suppression of the First Vision accounts, and in the second place, you say that it is possible that Joseph Fielding Smith did sit on the First Vision accounts. They both can't be correct at the same time. So when you say, I believe exactly what I've said about this subject, are you talking about the first thing or the second thing? Because you can't possibly be talking about both of them, at least not logically and honestly. That's what has so many people scratching their heads about what your real position is. It seems like you want to have it both ways. It seems like you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. This blog post goes on. A friend sent me a relevant note just slightly less than two hours ago. In part, it reads as follows. Now he's going to quote from this friend's email. And what this friend talks about is that... A member of the current church historian's office named Stephen Harper came out to do a presentation at their stake in Wyoming and he talked about the 1832 account of the first vision. Here's what that email says. Interestingly enough, Stephen Harper came and spoke to our stake yesterday. He addressed this very issue, indicating that the account, that's the 1832 account, that the account was brought across the plains by Willard Richards, got put into the historian's office, so far, this is correct. Now it goes off the rails a bit. And was subsequently neglected and lost in the stacks, so to speak. No, the problem isn't that it was subsequently neglected and lost in the stacks. The problem is, is that it was located, cut out, and hidden away in Joseph Fielding Smith's safe. Something a little bit different, I think you'll agree. It was discovered, this email goes on, it was discovered by a scholar in 1965 and has been widely disseminated since then. So I'm sure that Professor Peterson is quoting this email in support of his argument that since 1965, there has been no suppression of the 1832 account. And yet, inadvertently, he's also showing that Stephen Harper, currently employed in the church historian's office as a historian, is still going out to public venues in the church and peddling the fabrication and the falsehood that the reason the 1832 account did not come to public light until 1965 is because it was simply neglected and lost in the stacks. No, that's a cover-up. The church historian's office continues to cover up the cover-up. That's my main takeaway from this email that Daniel Peterson quotes in his second blog post. Daniel Peterson goes on, Moreover, while I'm open to the possibility that Elder Joseph Fielding Smith may have tried to hide or suppress the 1832 account of the first vision, wait a second, stop the presses. So now Daniel Peterson will admit 
that he's open to the possibility that Elder Joseph Fielding Smith may have tried to hide or suppress. He actually uses the word suppress, though he puts it in quotation marks. He actually uses the words here. He doesn't just say sat on like he did in his first blog post. He says suppress. But he does say that while he's open to the possibility that Joseph Fielding Smith may have tried to hide or suppress the 1832 account of the first vision, I'm not yet persuaded of it. Well, really, whether you're persuaded of it is not the issue here, Daniel Peterson. The issue is that you admit it's a possibility, and yet you still insist on standing by your statement that there was no suppression. You can't have it both ways, at least not in this universe. Daniel Peterson then says the relevant fair wiki article is worth reading in this regard. Now, this is going to be important. This is a wiki article. It's by Fair Mormon, and they put up a number of articles on the internet under Wikipedia. They have their own subsection, so they call it fair wiki. And in this article, which Daniel Peterson is kind enough to provide a link to, the question is, did Joseph Fielding Smith remove the 1832 account of Joseph Smith's first vision? from its original letter book and hide it in his safe. So this is a subject of enough interest and enough controversy that Fair Mormon has posted a response. Now, listen to their response. This is their one-sentence summary response. Quote, It is not known who removed the pages from the book or why, nor is it known when or why they were restored to the book. So notice what they're saying. They're saying, yes, these three pages with the 1832 account of the first vision were removed from the pages of the book, and later they were restored to the book. But what they want to cavil about is saying they don't know who did it or why. Well, we know that it ended up in Joseph Fielding Smith's safe, so it's unlikely it got there by anybody other than Joseph Fielding Smith. Going back to his blog, Daniel Peterson writes, And while you're at it, you might care to read this 2012 article, which I probably forced poor Stephen Smoot to write at gunpoint. Another minor error Daniel Peterson made there. It's not Stephen Smoot, it's Stephen Bukake Smoot. Apparently, Daniel Peterson is not aware of Stephen Smoot's new nickname. He then provides a link to a short article written by Stephen Bukake Smoot on the Fair Mormon website in which he derides and makes fun of people who did not know about the 1832 First Vision account because the church has been so upfront and so transparent in talking about it every general conference. See, I just did a reverse sarcasm on Stephen Smoot, which you'll understand if you read the article. Now, going back to Daniel Peterson's blog, however, he has now come up with another argument for his position as to why it is that Joseph Fielding Smith did not really try to suppress the 1832 account, and that is because after Joseph Fielding Smith was forced to put it back in the letter book because it had been leaked to the public, Joseph Fielding Smith did not thereafter try to suppress it. I'm serious. That's actually the argument he's making. Of course, he leaves out the part about how Joseph Fielding Smith had to put it back in the letter book because the Tanners found out about it and were making a big public stink about it. Here's how Daniel Peterson frames his argument. Incidentally, if Joseph Fielding Smith sought to hide the 1832 First Vision account, he did a remarkably poor job of it at the very time when he had the most power to suppress it. Again, I call attention to the following items, all of which appeared during the period when Joseph Fielding Smith was either president of the Twelve, an official church historian, or president of the church altogether. So now he's going to reference the same articles here that he referred to in his first blog post. One from 1965, one from 1966, one from 1969, one from 1970, and one from 1971. Again, Professor Peterson seems to be arguing that after Joseph Fielding Smith had suppressed and sat on the First Vision account for three decades and was forced to release it because news of its existence had been leaked to the public, after that, Joseph Fielding Smith did not suppress it anymore. And somehow, that's evidence that Joseph Fielding Smith did not suppress the 1832 account of the first vision. That seems to be his argument. I will read it to you once again. You tell me if it makes more sense to you. Incidentally, if Joseph Fielding Smith sought to hide the 1832 first vision account, he did a remarkably poor job of it at the very time when he had the most power to suppress it. Well, yeah, he did a remarkably poor job of suppressing it after he had suppressed it and then word that he was suppressing it got out and then he couldn't suppress it anymore. So yes, he did a bad job of suppressing it after he had suppressed it and couldn't suppress it anymore. Yes, I'm following you now, Professor Peterson. Excellent argument. And that is the end of the second blog post. Though Professor Peterson does not bring this up, I do want to bring up the argument that is made frequently in the comments section by Kiwi57. Yes, our good friend from down under, Kiwi57, likes the argument that if Joseph Fielding Smith had really wanted to suppress the 1832 account of the first vision, he would have burned it or put it in the paper shredder. And that because he did not do that, 
he actually did not suppress it. It's a remarkable argument, and one that only somebody who is completely committed to the defense of the LDS Church would even dream of making. It's like saying a robber who goes in and holds up a bank is not guilty of bank robbery because he only stole $10,000 and left $10,000 still in the safe. It just doesn't make sense. So that concludes Daniel C. Peterson's not one, but two blog posts that he posted on Sunday, June 9th, 2019, and again the following day on June 10th, 2019, all in response to Radio Free Mormon's podcast, calling him out for being deceptive when he said that there has been no suppression of the First Vision accounts. How well Daniel C. Peterson did in responding to that, I will let the listener decide. But Daniel C. Peterson was still not done. In a show of reckless abandon, Daniel C. Peterson went over to Bill Reel's Facebook page to post a message there. And before I get to that comment, I want to give Daniel Peterson credit for at least going over to Bill Reel's Facebook page and facing the music. This is what Daniel Peterson posted on Bill Reel's Facebook page. I've been intensely busy in the Middle East for the past six weeks, returning only last night. I leave the country again on Friday. I haven't listened to the podcast and very likely won't. Why on earth would he want to listen to the Radio Free Mormon podcast? He's too busy writing not one, but two blogs responding to my podcast to listen to it. So he says, I haven't listened to the podcast and very likely won't. However, some critics have shown up on my blog regarding the 1832 First Vision account, and I've responded to them there when they have. So basically saying he's not going to answer the charges on Bill Reel's Facebook page, but he's answered the charges over on his blog. And if you want to find out what his answer is, you can go over there and look for yourself. Bill Real does point out a certain irony in response when he says, For how busy you are all the time, telling everyone just how busy you are all the time, you certainly respond to a lot. Bill follows up with an invitation. And once again, I am happy to have you on in a recorded interview when you are not so busy. You apologists are always so busy. Smoot is always busy. John Lynch is always busy. Brian Hales gets too busy. And yet you guys spend what seems like the same ton of time on such things that I and others do. You pick the time. Hell, 2 a.m. if you want when you're not so busy. But Daniel Peterson, sad to say, does not take up Bill on his invitation. He says this, This is easy. I'll always be too busy for an interview. Chalk it up to pure terror, if you like. So Dan Peterson is not going to be interviewed by Bill Reel ever. He is always going to be too busy for that. He throws in chalk it up to pure terror, if you like. Because he knows that everybody's going to think, that he's a chicken, and that's why he won't go on Bill Reel's podcast. Well, the fact is, he is a chicken. It may not be pure terror, but he is a chicken. And the reason he's a chicken is because he knows that he cannot control the conversation with Bill Reel, and that Bill Reel will ask him one or more follow-up questions that will hold him to account for what it is that he says. He won't be able to get away with lying on Bill Reel's podcast, and therefore he will always be too busy. So I hope you've enjoyed this podcast talking about how Daniel Peterson defended his honor against the allegation from Radio Free Mormon that he lied when he said there's been no suppression of the First Vision accounts. While researching this episode, I have stumbled upon some very important historical data which continues to show that the LDS Church has in fact been suppressing its history from the members. I'm going to be doing a separate podcast exclusively on that subject. It will be titled The Missing 16 pages. If you enjoy what we're doing here at Radio Free Mormon, I encourage you to go to RadioFreeMormon.org right now and make a monthly contribution. $10, $25, $50 a month, whatever you can afford. I want to thank all those listeners who have contributed to the podcast and hope that those of you who have not yet made a contribution will do so today. I hope you've enjoyed this friendly exhibition tournament between Daniel Peterson and me in the ancient Chinese art of Mormon apologetics. Daniel-san, your kung fu is very strong, but Radio Free Mormon's kung fu is even stronger. That's about all for tonight. Until next time, this is Radio Free Mormon, signing off the air.